Okay, the next item of business is debate on motion 12455 in the name of Jackie Bailey on bringing down NHS waiting lists as they encourage members wishing to participate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Jackie Bailey to speak to and move the motion up to six minutes. Ms Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And can I start by thanking all the staff employed in the NHS? We know that they are working incredibly hard to care for us, but they are being let down by this SNP government. It's been two years and seven months since Hamza Youssef published the Scottish Government's NHS recovery plan. The First Minister at the time, Nicola Sturgeon, said this plan will drive the recovery of our NHS, not just to its pre-pandemic level, but beyond. That was August 2021. Since then, we have a new First Minister, who was, of course, the former Health Secretary, and we are on to our third Health Secretary. They all committed to the recovery plan. They promised to build 10 national treatment centres to provide an additional 55,500 procedures per year by 2025-26. They promised to increase diagnostic procedures by 78,000 in 2022-23. They promised to deliver 800 additional GPs by 2027 and give every GP practice access to a link worker. But the truth is that these promises have been broken. Only three national treatment centres are up and running, with the rest delayed and over budget. Diagnostic waiting lists are up by 55,000 since 2020, and only 271 whole time equivalent GPs have been hired in the last six years, and work hasn't even started on the much needed link workers in GP practices. Why is this important? Since the SNP promised Scots that they could fix the crisis in our NHS, the number of people on a waiting list has grown by almost 20%, from 608,000 to 825,000. Just picture the scale of that for a second. That's enough people to fill Murrayfield Stadium, not just twice or four times over, but 12 times over. And these are real people living in pain and discomfort, living with anxiety and uncertainty about when they will get the treatment they need. Now, the Scottish Government can spin it any way they want, and we know that they will try. But the reality is that they have fundamentally failed people right the way across this country. And here are some facts that might be uncomfortable for those on government benches. Ten years ago, just over 800 people on an inpatient waiting list still hadn't been seen after 12 weeks. In 2023, that figure was more than 101,000 cases. That's an increase of 125 times. That's not the only thing going up, presiding officer. Since 2013, the outpatient waiting list doubled. The inpatient waiting list more than doubled. The number of cancer referrals longer than the 31-day target has more than tripled. The number of cancer referrals longer than the 62-day target rose sevenfold. And the number of referrals for outpatient care waiting over 12 weeks rose 27 times. And here are some more facts about a and &E. Because in 2023, over 7,300 Scots waited more than a day in a and &E. And an FOI that we lodged revealed that patients waited in a and &E as long as 122 hours. That's almost five days waiting to be seen in accident and emergency. In January this year, the number of people stranded in A&E for more than eight hours <coughs> soared to over 17,800, while the number waiting more than half a day rose to over 8,800. Now, presiding officer, that is the highest number on record. In the same month, there were 57,860 days spent in hospital by people whose discharge was delayed, higher than the same point in 2023. And the SNP promised to end delayed discharge way back in 2015. Now, the reason it's serious is the Royal College of Emergency Medicine have calculated that there will be an excess death for every one in 72 patients who spend between eight and 12 hours in an emergency department. Based on these figures, that would equate to up to 2,000 excess deaths last year alone. 
And that is heartbreaking because it's preventable. Broken promises matter because failure to clear these waiting lists have real life consequences. And that's the legacy of this SNP government. They have even broken their own statutory 12 week treatment time guarantee 680,000 times since they introduced it and 320,000 times before the pandemic itself. But they still deny any responsibility. And what about the long waits? Well, it was Hamza Youssef who promised to eradicate two-year waits by, I think the date was September 2022. Yet, that date has come and gone, and we still have 7,170 Scots who have waited two years for treatment, 25 times more than the 282 patients waiting in England. And that is utterly shameful. And please don't insult our intelligence by trotting out the same old excuses. Health is devolved. You've been in charge for 17 years. Tell the people of Scotland, the people you have failed, what your plan is now. Tell them what the SNP will do to stop the delays with the new national treatment centres. Delayed in Esher and Arran, in Grampian, in Lanarkshire, in Lothian and in Tayside. Tell them where the £300 million for waiting lists announced last year will come from because it's not in the budget. Presiding officer, the SNP are out of time and out of ideas. And when it comes to the NHS, the SNP's record is a blizzard of rhetoric to hide a litany of deadly failures. I move the motion in my name. Thank you. Just to advise the Chamber, there really is no time in hand for this debate. And with that, I call Neil Gray to speak to a move amendment 12455.2. Cabinet Secretary, up to five minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. First of all, uh, to uh, address one of the criticisms uh, that Jackie Bailey uh, set out around responsibility, I absolutely uh, accept uh, responsibility. I want to apologise to anyone who has waited too long for treatment. We have been repeatedly clear that our NHS needs continual investment and reform to help recovery from the impact of the COVID pandemic. And pressures are evident before the pandemic as well. But for most people, the NHS offer an incredible service delivered by dedicated professional staff and in a timely manner. For too many, that is not the case. I accept that and uh, I uh, and, and, uh, feel that 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 is the key driver behind the need for reform that uh, we will be embarking upon. Our accident and emergencies face pressures for two principal reasons, the demand they are facing uh, and the challenges of patient flow through hospitals. And we're working with health boards to address both these challenges. Of course, we know that Scotland is not unique as services across the UK continue to experience similar challenges. Uh, on long waits in accident and emergency, the latest comparable 12-hour statistics for England in January, 13.2% of patients waited for 12 hours compared to 77 in Scotland and 155 in Wales. Planned care data for the last quarter of 2023 shows that in Scotland there were 124 patients waiting per thousand population for treatment time guarantee and new outpatient appointments. Uh, on the measures used in England and Wales, which I accept are distinct from our own, they show that in England there were 134 patients per, per thousand on the referral to treatment list, while in Wales there were 244 per thousand. Now, that is, of course, no comfort to those in Scotland waiting too long, but serves to underline the shared challenges and pressures across the UK, and that in spite of some of the uh, commentary, including some of what I expect we'll hear today, those challenges in performance are not unique to Scotland. Presiding officer, there are uh, signs of progress. Uh, over 2023, new outpatient activity increased from the previous year, uh, and the new outpatient list decreased for the first time since the end of 2021. Add to that, inpatient day case activity for the last quarter of 2023 was the highest since the start of the pandemic. We've seen a substantive reduction in new outpatient waits over two years since the targets were announced, with the number waiting over two years for a new outpatient appointment down by 66% from the end of June 22, and waits over two years for inpatient day case treatment also down by 25%. Cancer remains a priority, which is why we published our 10-year cancer strategy, along with an initial three-year cancer, cancer action plan in June last year. And to support cancer services with the highest weights, there is additional focus on urology, colorectal and breast, and clearing diagnostic and cl treatment backlogs. We are also working to ensure that all capacity is maximised, including our network of robots, to support cancer patients in receiving timely access to surgery. 
When it comes to investment in our former NHS, we are determined to go further, and I will set out uh, my thinking on the process of engage and how the process of engagement comes about soon. Uh, but we're trying to do that with one high tide behind our back from the UK government. Last week, the Chancellor had the opportunity to invest in public services like the NHS and in needed public infrastructure. Instead, he cut tax. In fact, the Tory Chancellor delivered a real terms cut to frontline health spending uh, in England. Funding for NHS pay deals uh, in England were not baselined, which means the consequentials from health were actually a reduction on what was provided in 2023-24. He promised investment in providing improving productivity in the NHS, when not a single penny uh, of that promised investment will be spent in 2024-25. In short, the Chancellor's budget brought yet more pain to the NHS to pay for tax cuts uh, and put off the necessary investment in reform. And it was the last desperate act of a Tory government that is gliding towards the exit door with all the grace of a hippo on roller skates. Sadly, the Labour election coordinator, Pat McFadden MP, confirmed last week that there were no specific policies in the Tory budget that Labour disagreed with. By backing the national insurance cuts from the Tories, Labour are backing that £1.7 billion that could have been spent in the NHS and infrastructure should now not come to Scotland. Not content with that, Labour in Scotland have also decided that it seems no longer to back progressive taxation. By adopting the progressive model we have in Scotland, we have made £1.5 billion available for services like the NHS. Labour, it seems, would abandon this. And at the very least, if we follow the course that Anna Sarwar set out before his conference, it would reduce the income tax take in Scotland by over £560 million, presiding officer. I am sorry, time concluding. is short, just as it was for Jackie Bailey's contribution. I apologise. I suppose the question for Labour is this. Whether informing the next UK government or your policies here, what will you cut? It's not enough to promise you'll fund the NHS. You need to put your money where your mouth is. You have to will the means as well as the end, because we have not seen any evidence of that thus far. Be straight with the people of Scotland if they're pursuing tax cuts, where will Labour's, Labour's cuts fall. And as, far, uh, as for the Tory amendment, uh, I would suggest Mr Galhani may want to double check his figures. If he checks the Treasury country and regional you analysis, I think he'll find that had frontline health spending in Scotland match per head spending levels in England, this would have seen our NHS get cumulatively around a £15 billion pound less investment than it had received under this SNP government. So to conclude, presiding officer, I am committed, this government is committed to making the changes that are essential for facing ongoing challenges, ensuring we provide a sustainable future for our uh, uh, NHS and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. We really do have no time in hand. I will be cutting uh, speakers uh, short at their uh, allocated time. Just to give due warning, I now call uh, Sandish Gulhani to speak to and move amendment 12455.1 up to four minutes. Dr Gulhani. I wish to draw members' attention to my register of interest as a practising NHS GP. I also wish to draw members' attention to the SNP Government's 2021 manifesto, where they promised to deliver a new Monklands Hospital renew the East of Scotland Cancer Care Centre and enhance primary care facilities throughout the country. And let's not forget whom's the use of so-called NHS recovery plan, one of the most underwhelming and poorly thought out pamphlets in NHS history. This promised to boost inpatient and day case activity through rolling out national treatment centres during the term of this parliament. But instead of investing, the SNP have frozen all investments in new NHS projects over the next two years at least. That's at least a dozen facilities on ice across six health boards. So if you live in NHS Lothian, Ayrshire and Arran, Tayside, Lanarkshire, Highlands or Grampian, it's not happening. The SNP, big on words, woeful on delivery. And under Humza Yusuf's government, one in ten outpatients are now waiting nearly a year for an appointment, while well, one in ten inpatients are waiting a year and a half. Fewer operations are now taking place than before the pandemic. And the Cabinet Secretary states that cancer is a priority. Well, just 65% of patients referred for colorectal cancer refer treatment within 62 days. Of course, the SNP Green Government blames anyone else but themselves. And that's because they don't take responsibility for their own failings. Instead, they'll cry it's all Westminster's fault. Now, I know they don't like to hear this, but the Scottish Government decides how to spend its budget, what to prioritise. And the fact is, the SNP Government, year in, year out, 
have chosen not to fully pass on the full Barnet consequentials for healthcare from the UK Treasury in Scotland's NHS. And that's some £17 billion of healthcare spending that the SNP has spent elsewhere on pet projects, while waits for diagnostics and treatments grew. Presiding Officer, Deputy Presiding Officer, healthcare is devolved and Scotland needs solutions. We agree with healthcare professionals who argue for a national conversation on our NHS. We are the first of Scotland's political parties to put pen to paper and develop a vision, a detailed, credible contribution to this conversation. We call for a modern, efficient and local approach to healthcare delivery. We would invest 12% of the NHS budget into GP clinics to open new facilities, recruit more staff and make more appointments available, particularly in rural areas. We would introduce an online booking system. We would also hold NHS management to account for their decisions. And unlike the SNP government, which rewards executives in failing health boards, we would provide better conditions for frontline staff and reward them, allow flexibility so they can enjoy a better work-life balance, which is key to staff recruitment and retention. We must be strategic and ditch SNP-style short-term solutions. That we know buys a little time between health secretaries, but results in devastating long-term consequences. And I move the amendment in my name. Thank you, Dr. Gulhani. I now call uh, Alex Cole Hamilton up to four minutes. Mr. Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, again and again and again we come back to this, and only it seems in opposition time. The facts laid out in Jackie Bailey's motion for today's debate make grim reading. Almost 825,000 patients in Scotland languishing currently on an NHS waiting list for tests or for treatment. This government is out of ideas for how to address this crisis. It seems content to make empty promises and then do very little indeed to keep them. Like Humza Yusuf's failed promise to eradicate waiting lists, which are only continuing to rise. Or the statutory 12-week treatment time guarantee broken 680,000 times since it was introduced. Or their promise made in the NHS recovery plan to deliver over 55,000 additional inpatient and day case procedures next year or by next year. But the hard stop on the construction of those national treatment centres means that that now will not be met. That too goes down as yet another broken promise by this half-hearted SNP Green government. Unacceptable weights have become synonymous with Scotland's NHS. It, I also feel compelled to mention uh, on today of all days, as they gathered outside our parliament, the 180,000 Scots whose lives have been shattered by long COVID. Many of them long haulers are entering their fifth year of grappling with that terrible condition. And yet still they are forced to wait in vain for recognition, support and for treatment pathways from this government. I have lost count of the number of times we've had debates like this in this chamber. And I fear this government has become all too comfortable with crisis. It is almost inured to it. But, presiding officer, something has got to give. It simply must. Every time we raise the state of the NHS in this place, ministers will often seek to blame the pandemic. When they do so, they insult the intelligence of us all, and they seriously test the patience of both staff and people seeking care. We all know that the issues in our NHS were there long before anyone had heard of Wuhan, China or COVID-19, and people are tired of those excuses. Nowhere is that true or more true than in NHS staff themselves. The chair of the BMA in Scotland has said that NHS staff, uh, staff are, and I quote, exhausted and facing burnout. Staff and patients alike need new hope. Our health service needs leadership and it needs stability. But when it comes to the position of health secretary, it seems there is no stability to be had. Just a grim game of musical chairs. Neil Gray now needs to show this chamber and the watching public that he is capable of innovative thinking and he is also open to reform. When Hamza Yusuf was in his position, he repeatedly ignored my party's calls for a plan to address staff burnout and to set up a health and social care staff assembly. That this government have shown pig-headed contempt for policies that would guarantee annual leave, ensure safe staffing levels and champion the expertise of those who know our health service best. We need to retain experienced staff if we are to bring down waiting lists. Rather than making the meaningful investment our health service needs, this government is relying on short-term fixes to plug the gap. 
is also failing to tackle the huge issue of delayed discharge, which is leaving people languishing in hospital wards when they should be at home. That too causes an interruption in flow throughout our whole of our NHS and is manifest in emergency care delays. Instead, it is indulging its bureaucratic tendencies in the name of a vast, expensive and unwanted centralisation of social care. Presiding officer, I could go on. Such is the litany of problems in our NHS under this government's watch. People need to know they can rely on a health service. They need to know that they will be tested, diagnosed and treated in a timely fashion so as to have the best chance of recovery. The competent management of our health service is perhaps the primary thing we elect a Scottish Government to do. It is failing in that regard. The Health Secretary needs to do three things. You need to conclude, Mr Cole Hamilton. I will do, and I'll tell you about that in the next time we come to this in opposition time. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. We now move to the open debate. I call Carol Mochen to be followed by Ruth Maguire. Up to four minutes, uh, Ms Mochen. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today's debate is of critical importance and it is right that we continue to use our time in this chamber to debate the topics that match to the priorities of the Scottish people. Whilst the SNP Government might want to hide from the responsibilities and its record when it comes to the NHS, we on these benches have a responsibility to hold them to account on behalf of patients and staff who for too long have been let down. The NHS is my party's proudest achievement. It is our country's most beloved asset and it is an asset that belongs to everyone. When Bevan and Attlee established the NHS, it had the key founding principles of being free at the point of need, being a high quality employer delivering first class service and being an institution that would never discriminate when it came to the provision of health care. The founding principles of the NHS were important in 1948, and I argue they are even more important in 2024. BMA Scotland Chairman Dr Ian Kennedy has said, we have sleepwalked into our current situation. He goes on, we are now seeing the founding principles of the NHS, namely that it should be free at the point of need, threatened, and he says, this is the inevitable consequences of years of ducking the hard decisions. Mm. And yet it continues, the Scottish Government, in its amendment today, has managed to blame just about every factor other than its inability uh, to meet the challenges facing the NHS today. I think their self-congratulatory amendment will not be well received by the hundreds of thousands of Scots from across the country who are needlessly on long waiting lists. Indeed, the truth is, presiding officer, um, Let's be in no doubt waiting lists are soaring, people are waiting in pain and our, un and our NHS is under extreme pressure. Now, the Cabinet Secretary knows I am never fearful of calling out Tory austerity. But in this instance, this government is responsible for the devolved powers for NHS. And because of the serious mismanagement and I think the broken promises Along with the arrogance of not accepting any responsibility, we are not in a good place for patients or staff here in Scotland's NHS. The SNP want to be in power, but they do refuse to take responsibility. And I think patients and staff are tired of the endless excuses. Our NHS needs change, and there is a recognition that this tired government is not up to delivering that change. Now, I accept the Cabinet Secretary is only just in post, but thanks to his predecessor, the challenge before him is a significant one. One in seven Scots on NHS waiting lists and rising, despite the First Minister, as we've heard, a commitment to eradicating this and a treatment time guarantee, which I am going to report, re repeat, has been broken 680,000 times. No one in underestimates the impact of the pandemic on our health services and staff agree, but the reality is, as, as outlined in the Labour motion, that the guarantee has been broken far too many times, 320,000 times before the COVID-19 pandemic. Presiding officer, it is fair to say that um, key commitments in the NHS recovery plan are not being met. These issues are being exacerbated by the Scottish Government's decisions to halt NHS capital projects, projects that are so desperately needed. Not only has the Cabinet Secretary let down my constituents in the south of Scotland, who will be waiting longer for the National Treatment Centre air, but he cannot seem to even get a hospital built in his own backyard. The impact of this decision will see waits lengthen and lengthen, 
People must see the Government Act. Under the Scottish Government, our tremendous NHS staff have been pushed to the limit. You Services are breaking conclude. at breaking point, and this Government must take action. Thank, Thank you, you. I now call Ruth Maguire to be followed by Edward Mountain. Up to four minutes, Ms Maguire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Waiting for an operation or treatment undoubtedly adds pressure and stress to what is an already stressful time, for some intolerably so. I appreciate that waiting can exacerbate the problem and that the patient is waiting for treatment. Um, it brings additional issues, stress and anxiety. I will never minimise that human impact. Challenges facing Scotland's NHS are not unique, and the significant impact of COVID-19 since 2019 on the normal operation of the NHS cannot be underestimated. In saying that, I'm not pretending that everything was perfect prior to the pandemic. I'm simply acknowledging the reality of where we are now and the scale of challenge that we face. Opposition parties should, of course, put whatever they want in their motions, but it won't be lost on folk that Labour have brought forward a motion about NHS pressures and not included a single mention about the impact of COVID and the pandemic. All MSPs receive regular contact from their local health boards. We should all know the impact it has had. And there's no doubt that the pandemic has been the biggest shock that the NHS and health services in Europe and globally have faced. That's not unique to Scotland and cannot be ignored. The pandemic has clearly impacted on health services right across the UK. Acknowledging the reality of where we are is important. Um, I'll give way now. Sarah Boyack. Thank you very much. The, the member rightly mentioned COVID, but uh, as she may know, we met with people who have suffered from long COVID and there is no support coming from her SNP government. So what does she suggest to them? Ruth Maguire. I would acknowledge the difficulty faced by those with, with long COVID. Um, the, the Cabinet Secretary outlined a number of steps that the, the, the Scottish Government is taking. Ministers have published the National Health and Social Care Workforce Strategy, which sets out a long-term vision for achieving sustainable health and social care workforce. The fact that the Scottish Government values the NHS workforce and is committed to investing in the NHS workforce is demonstrable. Um, there's a number of steps that we've taken. We're so, so short of time, I'll not go through them all. Um, I would say, however, that of course Scotland remains the only country in the UK to have been successful in averting NHS strikes. I point that out not by way of self-congratulation, but because actions around staffing are what will make the difference to the running of our NHS and how our citizens experience their care within it. Recruitment and retention of staff, their well-being, that is what is important to the sustainability of NHS Scotland's ability to provide efficient services amidst the current challenges it faces. I do think that we need to look closely at routes to a rewarding career of public service within the NHS and reflect where previous decisions may have had unintended consequences. For example, where surgeons now specialise at the beginning of their careers, um, there is a lack of general surgical consultants um, causing some challenge within my own health board. For allied health professionals and nursing, can we look at more apprenticeships, earn as you learn and work type programmes that could also provide progression and development opportunities for existing health and social care staff, as well as being attractive to other adults who would wish for a career change but for whom four years at university is not an option. I would welcome the Minister's comments on these. I know that there is some work ongoing, but it feels like something that we need to pick up the pace on and indeed something that could be really beneficial for individual citizens and the healthcare system as a whole. Presiding Officer. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and I call Edward Mountain to be followed by Sarah Boyack. Uh, up to four minutes, Mr Mountain. Thank, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to thank the Labour Party for bringing this debate on health issues. It's something we only seem to discuss during opposition time, and I think it's a disgrace. I also think it's a disgrace for the Cabinet Secretary to sit there and amend the motion, putting a lot of the blame on COVID. Let me give you some of the facts. In NHS Highland, prior to COVID, waiting times for orthopedic, or the orthopaedic list was well in excess of 2,000 people. The ophthalmic list was so long that we were flying people up from south of the border to do operations at a week at weekend, and treatment times were appalling. On top of that, we had an unappreciated staff force, work, workforce where bullying was rampant in NHS Highland, and we paid, end up having to pay £2.8 million in compensation to those people that were bullied. There were high sickness rates, 
and huge amounts of vacancies, especially within the radiology department. Those are the facts, Cabinet Secretary, and that happened before COVID. Now, post-COVID, we're in the situation where we have orthopaedic waiting lists, which were judged by a university the other day that could extend to seven years. And that these people cannot be treated within the National Treatment Centre because they are too sick. Their, their orthopaedic operations require too much care to go into the National Treatment Centre. And look at audiology. Well, if you're, if you're in Inverness, it's not bad news as far as waiting lists are concerned. You've got a 28-week wait to get an appointment. And when you get your appointment, you then have 49 weeks to wait before you get a hearing aid. But if you're in WIC, it gets substantially worse. You've got 31 weeks to wait for an appointment and 64 weeks to wait for a hearing aid. You know, that's nearly two years from start to finish to get a hearing aid. You can pop down to Boots and get them in three weeks. This is a disgrace and it's not acceptable. And when it comes to the National Treatment Centre, I applaud the government for taking what they've done on that. It was late and it was over budget. And it is working, though, for our orthopaedic patients, but only a certain amount of them, those that are less ill and can be treated overnight. But we've got ophthalmic theatres in, within the National Treatment Centre being, not being used. Why is it not being used? Because they haven't managed to recruit the surgeons to do that. You can build as many as you like, but if you can't get the staff cabinet secretary to work them, um, that's no help. Now, I want to talk specifically about something which I find deeply disturbing, and that's neurological development assessments. This is about waiting lists. Now, I've tried to find out what the waiting list in NHS Highland area is for neurological development assessments. It's not easy because it's partly held by the Highland Council and partly held by uh, NHS Highland. Last figures I got that there were 800 people uh, children waiting for neurological development assessments on the NHS Highland list and a further 600 waiting on the, on the Highland Council waiting list to get onto the NHS Highland waiting list. So you've got, 15, well, you've got approximately uh, 1,400 people, children, waiting to get a neurological development assessment. Now, that to me is, not, is unacceptable, especially when I was told, Cabinet Secretary, that they would have to wait 15 years. The person at the bottom of the list would have to wait 15 years to get a neurological development assessment. That means they would be finished in school before they got the, the help that they needed. I would also just point out very briefly, I know my time is running out. No, you're not going to have time, Mr. Mountain. That it appears in NHS Highlands that a wait, when there's a waiting list, not a waiting list, it's a, not a waiting list when you're on a waiting list to get on a waiting list. Thank and you. We are now going to have to move on. Disgrace. I call Sarah Boyack to be followed by Emma Harper. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to start by commending the work of our incredible NHS staff across Scotland, and I hope we can all agree that they have been doing remarkable work given the challenges they face. But their already challenging work is being made significantly harder by the neglect inflicted upon the NHS by the SNP Government. And while the NHS is struggling across all of Scotland, I want to highlight in particular the pressures facing services in Lothian, where our hospitals are already under huge pressure and waiting times for vital operations are increasing. And those pressures will continue as our population grows. 84% of Scotland's future population growth will be in Lothian, and our NHS services urgently need investment. Nowhere is this clearer in the case of the Eye Pavilion. The building was declared unfit for purpose in 2014, a decade of unsuitable facilities for people who need vital, life-changing services such as eye surgery. And how did the SNP government respond to this? Yet more broken promises and ultimately freezing capital spending on this desperately needed new eye hospital, along with other national treat treatment centres that are urgently needed across Scotland. And it's not just an issue for Lothian residents. A quarter of people with sight loss in Scotland are having to rely on facilities that are not fit for purpose with zero, zero reassurance and nothing in the way of timescales from the Scottish Government to give them any confidence that things are going to change. And the end result for our patients is that life becomes significantly harder and treatment becomes 
often inaccessible. People experiencing sight loss are often more restricted in their transport options, yet they are being made to travel to Clydebank or even to Newcastle if they want to retrieve NHS treatment for their eye condition at personal cost that is not acceptable, because every patient on that waiting list is not a statistic. They are a real person with a real experience. We spoke to a constituent facing a 17-month 17 17-month 17 wait for treatment, and she simply couldn't wait that long as her sight was deteriorating. When she wrote to my office, she was about to take on significant debt just to pay for simple but life-changing experience in the private sector because she could not wait for that NHS treatment. Now, that is unacceptable. It's an unthinkable choice, going into debt or losing your sight. It's a choice she should never have faced, a direct result of the failed promises of this SNP government, who continue to let down patients across Scotland and, as Carol Mocken highlighted, undermining the key principles of our NHS. Those stories are commonplace. I'm sure members across the chamber have similar tales to tell. In the Lothians, waiting times have trebled over the last nine years. But just take the number of people waiting more than 16 weeks. That has increased from 156 to over 9,000 patients. As Jackie Bailey and Carol Mocken highlighted, the pressures our NHS faces, created and compounded by the lack of support from the SNP Government, it is not enough just to blame the UK Government. That's a refusal to take responsibility from the problems on our doorstep over the last 17 years. And it's not just the Eye Pavilion that's not happening. At the National Treatment Centre in Livingston, our urgently needed new cancer investment centre in Edinburgh. The SNP Government needs to act now to bring down waiting list times to ensure that everyone in Scotland gets the treatment they need when they need it. Waiting times are not regrettable with the delays. They are utterly unacceptable and our constituents deserve better. Thank you. I now call Emma Harper to be followed by uh, Sharon Dowie. Up to four minutes, Ms Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Um, I start by reminding members that I am a registered nurse, former clinical educator and perioperative clinical practitioner. And of course, it is important to reduce NHS waiting times. And, you know, for, for an example, you know, the complexity of working for me in the perioperative environment in theatre. It's a complex environment which requires specialist surgical teams, consultants, surgeons, anaesthetists, nurses, perioperative support workers, as well as ancillary coordination with labs, blood banks, radiology, and everyone requires knowledge, skills, competency, and training. And everyone working in these areas and across the NHS must be commended for their commitment to providing the best care for their patients. Tackling waiting times is no easy feat. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government is choosing to invest more than £19.5 billion in health and social care in 2024-25, giving our NHS a real terms uplift despite the UK Government's austerity. And this does include a £14.2 billion of investment in our NHS boards with additional investment of over half a billion. And it is worth noting that NHS to Fries and Galloway and the Scottish Borders in my South Scotland region are receiving a real terms uplift in funding. And of course, this is not without its challenges, though. I think it is worth noting that this current budget passed by this Parliament will do more for our NHS. It provides an additional £230 million to support delivery of the pay uplift to a minimum of £12 per hour for adult social care workers in third and private sectors from April 2024, representing a 10.1 per cent increase for all eligible workers. It also invests in over £2.1 billion for primary care to improve preventative care in the community, supporting the development of multidisciplinary teams in general practice, sustaining NHS dental care through enhanced fees and continuing free eye examinations. And it supports spend in excess of £1.3 billion for mental health services, for which there is an ever-increasing ever -increasing demand. These are welcome commitments, given the current strain on all budgets due to economic mismanagement from Westminster. 
However, presiding officer, despite this investment, the system is under extreme pressure as a result of ongoing impacts of pandemic recovery, Brexit and inflation and UK government spending decisions. So I welcome that the Scottish Government will continue to target resources to reduce waiting times, particularly for those waiting longest for treatment through maximising productivity and additional resource. Investing in Scotland's NHS is, a non, is non-negotiable for the Scottish Government. And against the challenging economic and financial context, the Scottish Government is taking the difficult and necessary decisions to ensure continued investment in health and social care services. The UK spring budget was nothing short of a betrayal of public services across the whole of the UK. And the budget provided less in Barnet consequentials from, for health than in in-year health consequentials of 2023-24. And it's failed to deliver more capital funding for infrastructure. And based on the latest forecast, Scotland's block grant for capital is now expected to reduce in real terms by £1.3 billion by 2027-2028. And I know time is short, presiding officer, but I was interested to hear Carol Malkin when she said she was proud of her party that created the NHS. Well, I wonder if she's proud of Labour Shadow Health Secretary saying that he would hold the door wide open to the NHS for the private sector if his party wins the next general election. Presiding officer, we have major challenges in our NHS with lots of things to consider, but the threat to Scotland's NHS that comes from Westminster parties of all colours is, is going to be damaging for, for us in Scotland, but if we had independence, we'd be able to manage Thank much you. better. Right. Thank you. I now call Shan Dowie to be followed by Willie Coffey. Up to four minutes, Ms Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I start by thanking all the staff who work throughout the NHS? Yep. Today's debate is on the issue that we MSPs probably hear about the most from our constituents. Wherever you represent, the dire and depressing problems in our NHS are having a terrible impact on people across Scotland. Our NHS has been in a constant state of crisis for many years under the SNP. And this sorry situation is getting worse, not better. I want to briefly reiterate some of the shocking statistics that others have highlighted here today in the hope that the government will finally take notice. Over 820,000 people are on the NHS waiting list in Scotland. January 2024 was the worst month on record for long a and &E waits. One in 10 patients are waiting nearly a year for appointments. It was hard to imagine these statistics getting any worse, but then Hamza Yusuf introduced his recovery plan, and yet somehow they did get worse. His recovery plan didn't improve treatment times, it let them spiral further. He made bold, big, bold promises when he launched that plan, but almost none of them have been delivered. And that's the really damning thing about the SNP's handling of our health service. It's bad enough that they preside over repeated failures, but it's a real slap in the face to patients that they keep making promises that they don't keep. They promised to increase the number of GPs by 800 by 2027. So far, GP numbers have decreased by 26. In rural areas, getting an in-person GP appointment can now be a nightmare. They promised to end delayed discharge and free up hospital beds. The problem is as bad as ever and it's costing Scotland's NHS a fortune. And today, I want to focus on one particular broken promise to people in Ayrshire, the promise to deliver a national treatment centre at Carrick Glen. That centre has been delayed for years, and judging by the SNP's track record, who knows if it will ever happen. The network of national treatment centres across the country were originally an SNP election pledge. Not this year, not in 2022, 2021, 2019, 17 or even 16. This national network was promised way back in 2015. At the time, then SNP First Minister Nicola Sturgeon said, if we don't act to prepare now for 10 and 20 years ahead, our NHS will be overwhelmed by the demand. Well, she got one thing right. Nearly 10 years on, the NHS is now overwhelmed by demand because the SNP didn't act. Hamza Yusuf doubled down on her grand promises when he came to air for a photo op to announce the Carrick Glen Centre before the 2022 election. He said that day that 
The network of national treatment centres will be central to NHS recovery. Just like photo ops with the doomed ferries, this one was clearly all for show. Hamza Yusuf added later, the National Treatment Centre programme will deliver the single biggest increase in protected planned care capacity ever created in NHS Scotland. The single biggest increase in care has turned into the single biggest letdown of patients across Ayrshire. Local people are seeing waiting times for treatment rise. They are seeing ICU beds moved away from their hospital to Cross House because they can't recruit staff. They are seeing long waits for a GP appointment. But it is an election year, so no doubt they will soon once again be seeing Hamza Yusuf in a pair of scrubs, making another big promise he won't deliver. The problem for the SNP is local people also see right through this charade. They deserve a lot better than another batch of soon-to-be-broken promises. Thank you, President. Thank you, Ms. Day. We now move to the final speaker in the uh, open debate, Willie Coffey, up to four minutes. Mr Coffey. Thanks very much, President Officer. We can always rely on Labour to put up a motion complaining about the management of the NHS, full of negativity, not a word of encouragement to the thousands of staff working extremely hard day in, day out, to deliver health care and keep us all safe. The SNP motion does that, and I'm happy to put on record my thanks to the NHS staff that I know personally and the entire workforce who are still working under the most difficult times we have faced in a generation. The Labour motion is little more than numbers and criticisms, but there is another story to tell. I will share a few facts and figures from Ayrshire and Ireland that might help to balance out their narrative a bit. First, though, a gentle reminder that it was our Labour friends who planned to shut the accident and emergency unit at Air Hospital, and it was the incoming SNP government who kept it open. Much to the delight of the 55,000 or so people in Ayrshire who signed that petition and the many thousands who have continued to benefit since. A decision never welcomed by Labour from that day to this. How dare the SNP reverse Labour's closure plans for air and save the unit and save lives as a result? Presiding officer, COVID hasn't disappeared and its impact will ripple on for some time yet. Not my words but the words of our excellent Chief Executive Nersha Narn Clare Burden, who is working tirelessly to get through these times. Last year, there were over one and a quarter million GP consultations carried out in Nersha and Narn. That is real people getting a fantastic service from their dedicated GPs. We have 465,000 outpatient appointments satisfied, a huge demand met involving a range of NHS staff to achieve this. And we have satisfied over 100,000 out of hours appointments through our Ayrshire Urgent Care Service. Our emergency departments, including AIR, dealt with over 93,000 life or death situations, saving lives every day. Currently in Ayrshire and Arran, the situation is as difficult as anywhere else, but the pause in the national treatment centres has not affected the service provision there, according to our Chief Exec. Our centre in the meantime, we have managed to benefit from the recruitment of ad additional staff down there and an orthopaedic surgeon. We have more capacity than in previous years. At Air Hospital, we now have a dedicated station for orthopaedic surgery, and that team has some of the highest productivity and high performance figures Scotland wide. Waiting times for outpatients are increasing. There is no doubt about that, because demand is currently outstripping Ayrshire's ability to get through the backlog. Recruitment is ongoing, though, thanks to the additional budget support provided by this SNP Government. In terms of other performance achievements, the numbers of inpatient day cases continues to fall. Performance in relation to the 31-day cancer treatment target also continues to meet the 95 per cent level, and it was actually 100 per cent in November last year. Compliance with the endoscopy target has also improved to its highest level since 2020. And lastly, compliance with the Child and Adult Mental Health Services target also reached 100 per cent in November last year, exceeding that target by 10 percentage points. So a huge well done to Ayrshire and Arran NHS staff. Not that we would hear any of that good news from Labour, but you will hear it from me and the thousands of patients who are getting high quality care and life-saving treatment on a daily basis in Ayrshire and Arran. One final note, President Officer, is a request from Ayrshire and Arran for the public to engage more directly with the legal processes to establish power of attorney for their family members. This will significantly help all health boards to improve the situation relating to discharge, delayed discharge, 
Over half of the delayed discharge cases in Ayrshire and Arran involving loss of capacity are caused by this issue alone and not by performance or lack of community care provision. The worst figures are in Tory run South Ayrshire for this problem. Who knows? Maybe even Labour will welcome this news and our resident Tory GPs who is in the Chamber might be aware of this too. You do need to conclude, Mr. President Officer, I support the amendment from the Government and ask the Parliament to reject the relentlessly negative Labour motion and Tory amendments. Thank you. We now move to the wind up speeches and I call first Tess White. Tess White, up to four minutes, please. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Audit Scotland hit the nail on the head when it said that there has been no unified vision for the NHS since 2013 under this SMB government. And that's Audit Scotland. A decade later, and patients and frontline staff are paying the price for the SNP's mismanagement of the NHS. Only the SNP Green Government could make the National Treatment Centres the linchpin of its NHS recovery plan and then yank the funding for them. You just couldn't make it up, presiding officer. National treatment centres in NHS Lothian, NHS Ayrshire and Arran, NHS Lanarkshire, NHS Tayside and NHS Grampian in my own region have all been left in limbo. Meanwhile, as we've heard today, patients in chronic pain have been left to languish on waiting lists for months and even years. MSP inboxes are full of heart-wrenching accounts of people desperate for treatment. A constituent contacted me earlier this week after being referred for a gastroenterology appointment by her GP. The NHS Inform website said the current wait to be seen was six weeks. After speaking to staff, she was told it would be 40 two weeks, and that's a different la-la land to the la-la land Mr Coffey's talking about. She said she came off the, off the phone lost for words. Sharon Dowie talked about the SNP's broken promise to people in Ayrshire who've been waiting years for a national treatment centre at Carrick Glen. She highlighted that the SNP knew nine years ago what would happen if the capacity in NHS wasn't increased there, but they haven't been delivered. They've dithered and delayed. And Ruth Maguire today blamed COVID, but Edward Mountain raised serious concerns in NHS Highland, Highlands before COVID. The SNP might try to blame everyone but themselves for these failures, but the SNP amendment today certainly takes a crack at it. But the SNP Green Government has full control over the NHS in Scotland. As the Scottish Conservatives Amendment emphasises and Dr Sandesh Gulhani highlighted, it has full control over healthcare investment and how it spends that budget. And the Cabinet Secretary might shake his head, but that's the truth. Dr Gulhani was right to say that, in, that year in, year out, the SNP Government has chosen not to pass on the full Barnet consequentials from the UK Treasury to Scotland's NHS. Take note. The SNP government is responsible for the decisions it makes, but the SNP seem to enjoy the trappings of power and not the responsibility. Yet today, Neil Gray, as the new SNP Cabinet Secretary of Health, did publicly accept responsibility. And that's rich after 17 years of inertia and inaction of successive health secretaries. Nicola Sturgeon, Shona Robeson, Jean Freeman, Humza Youssef, Michael Matheson has left our NHS in a desperately sorry state. Despite the heroic efforts of NHS staff on the front line, there are record waits for treatment, record waits to be seen in A&E, massive increases in private operations, major blockages in ambulance turnaround times. Presiding officer, the SNP government is out of ideas and out of time. It must adopt the Scottish Conservatives' plans for a modern, efficient local NHS to secure the future of our healthcare system and save lives. Thank you. Thank you, Ms White. I now call on Marie Todd um, to wind up for the Government Minister. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First and foremost, I want to thank those who are at the heart of our NHS for their commitment, their hard work and their dedication to provide the best care possible to the people of Scotland. I'm going to focus much of my response on mental health, which is in my portfolio. 
We remain committed to our priorities driving down waiting times and improving mental health. And in our CAMS waiting times, we've seen sustained improvement, which gives us good grounds for optimism. The CAM system performance has recovered to better than pre-pandemic levels, and we can take our learning from that and apply it to other areas. We must recognise where we see improvement in national performance against the 18-week CAM standard in the last quarter is the fourth highest since records began and the highest achieved since the quarter ending March 2016. Um, I have very little time. The last two years, 22 and 23, showed the highest number on record of people starting treatment from CAMS. In one or two pe people referred to CAMS now start treatment within six weeks down from 10 weeks in the previous quarter. Now that's been made possible, firstly, by the hard work of our CAMS workforce, which has more than doubled under this government, but also improvements have been supported by direct investment from the Scottish Government, firstly through the Recovery and Renewal Fund, from which 40 million was allocated to implement the CAM specification, then by the Outcomes Framework, which amounted to 55.5 million in 23-24 for improvements to mental health services, including CAMS. Now, through additional investment, we have been setting the conditions needed for long-term sustainable improvement to the CAM system. It has taken time for our investment to be reflected in national waiting times performance as boards worked hard to clear their backlogs. But now we are seeing evidence of significant and sustained progress, including high levels of activity in CAMs and significant improvements in waiting lists. We have and we will continue to provide enhanced support to those boards where waits are the longest. This enhanced support package will focus on the delivery of national CAM specification, local improvement plans and trajectories trajectories to meet the standard and to plan to clear backlogs. I'm afraid I have very little time, Mr Mountain. The issue of delayed discharges is absolutely a challenging one, also in my portfolio. We know that the delays in receiving the most appropriate care in the right environment can be detrimental to a person's physical and mental health. And we know that delayed discharges also have significant consequences for the normal flow of patients through hospitals. How do we rise to face this challenge? Well, it is helpful that in Scotland we have more beds per head of population, more health professional staff, and those staff are better paid. Hospital at home is another response. The older people's service is now similar to a hospital the size of University Hospital Wishaw. And whilst it's absolutely true that the level of delayed discharge is unacceptable in Scotland, and we take responsibility for that. It is very clear that this is a problem that is not unique to Scotland. Now, it is difficult to make comparisons between UK nations, but the numbers do speak for themselves. In Scotland, 22 patients are delayed in acute um, hospitals per 100,000 adults. In Tory-run England, that number is 31 per 100,000 adults, much higher. In Scotland, the total number of delayed discharges is 42 per 100,000. In Labour-run Wales, that number is, wait for it, 62 per 100,000. Um, a number of members made some excellent suggestions. Ruth Maguire's suggestion on um, c considering alternative training pathways for health professionals, very welcome. Nursing and Midwifery Task Force are already considering You do it. need to conclude, Minister. Presiding officer, the challenges and opportunities that we face need action. Our NHS is our most cherished published service and we must work together to deliver the changes we need for the future to deliver sustainable and high quality services that the people of Scotland deserve. Thank, Thank you. you. I now call on Paul Sweeney to wind up the debate up to five minutes. Mr Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And of course, Labour has used its opposition day to day to raise the critical issue of waiting times in our National Health Service here in Scotland, because it is a reflection on an issue that every one of us has a stake in. It is our communities, our family members, our relatives, our colleagues and friends who are at risk as a result of the NHS not performing to the best it can. And that is a responsibility this Parliament must take cognizance of, because it is the single most important area of public policy that this Parliament has to deal with. And the facts, I'm afraid, are stark and are incontrovertible. 
And despite the government's attempts to erase these facts and their amendment to Labour's motion today, they remain. Almost 825,000 patients are currently on NHS waiting lists for tests and treatment in Scotland. That is more than the combined population of Glasgow and Dundee. It is simply unsustainable and unacceptable. That takes a huge national pressure. It means we have a sicker population and a vicious cycle that continues to affect every area of public life. Long waits have continued to rise, despite the First Minister's promise to eradicate them entirely. So we are not seeing an effort to get ahead of the problem at a sufficient rate. The 12-week treatment time guarantee indeed has been broken 680,000 times since it was introduced, the equivalent of more than the entire population of Glasgow alone. And the government have committed to delivering 55,500 additional procedures, which has not been met. And indeed, the Minister, in her closing remarks, mentioned that areas of improvement include CAMS waiting lists. Well, I'm afraid this is a bit of a mirage because I investigated what was going on in Glasgow and discovered that the only reason they have been going down in Glasgow is because face-to-face -face consultations have been substituted for telephone consultations. That is simply not good enough, Minister, and it is not good enough to come to this chamber and make that sort of misrepresentative characterisation of what is actually going on in our CAMS system. As I said, these are our families and friends who are languishing on these waiting lists, awaiting care that they desperately need while well, their health and overall outcomes worsen. These are the people who email us on a daily basis. These are the people who come to our constituency advice surgeries uh, in desperate uh, situations, eager to get support. And it's not good enough for the government to simply deny their lived experience, their reality. It's our duty as parliamentarians to give voice to their frustrations and their difficulties. The Scottish Government talk about waiting well, but unfortunately people are dying while waiting. And we've heard numerous examples of the terrible situations that are going on. Indeed, 18,390 patients died in 2022 while stuck on an NHS waiting list. And there has been a 39% rise in deaths since before the pandemic in 2019. So it simply isn't good enough for the government to use the pandemic as an excuse uh, and I think the member for Kilmarnock and Urban Valley ought to listen more to his constituents in that regard instead of patronising them in the way he did in his speech. In fact, Ms Boyat, member for Lothians, did highlight our excellent NHS clinicians, but they are being betrayed too. They are being betrayed too. They are not just working in obsolete facilities like the Edinburgh Eye Pavilion, but oncologists who have came to this very parliament in the last few weeks told us in devastating terms that they are watching cancer patients go from being treatable at the point of diagnosis to terminally ill. Indeed, I've met them personally in Glasgow's hospices. That is a betrayal. It is an extrajudicial death sentence that has been visited on the people of Scotland in some instances. That is the reality of what's going on. That is what taking responsibility means. It's not just saying it, it's dealing with it, it's addressing it. And we all have a stake in this matter. Yes, I have to give away. Briefly, Alistair Allen. I thank the member for giving away. Does he also accept that taking responsibility means not committing yourselves for two years to Tory spending plans? Paul Sweeney. Well, that's simply not a characterisation that's true. The fiscal rules being set are about improving economic growth by applying discipline to public spending. Here's a good example. The government sits here impotently denying that they can invest in national treatment centres because of capital spending constraints whilst wasting £1.2 billion on delayed discharge. That is incompetence and it simply does not stand any scrutiny to say that the ability to ca undertake capital investment is not available. This is about addressing a vicious cycle. I urge the government ministers to stop thinking like accountants and start thinking like economists, like the Audit Scotland reports have urged, because this is all about connecting up a whole system. The member for Highland and the Tories, uh, Mr Mountain, highlighted just one example, which might be more benign, about hearing aids. But this is backdoor privatisation, because it basically means you cannot access dental treatment, you can't get hearing aids, you can't get eye tests. So those who can pay and those who can't languish and suffer, can't go to work, can't actually function as citizens. We get a sicker population and a less economically productive society. This is the vicious cycle this government has to address. It simply does not stand to stand and point at other parts of the UK. Take responsibility and address these issues as we should here as parliamentarians in Scotland. Thank you. That concludes the debate on bringing down NHS waiting lists. There will be a brief pause uh, before we move to the next item of business to allow the front benches to change.